So for our next unit, we're going to be talking about genetics. We're going to start with Mendelian genetics, which are sort of simple crosses. Then we're going to talk about chromosomes and how they're related to genetics. Then we're going to get into molecular genetics and talk about DNA. And we'll wrap it up with genetic engineering. How can we control and manipulate DNA? So before we even get started, a quick comment. Keep in mind that genetics is based on chance or probability. So if you make a prediction, for example here, that you flip a coin, there's a one-half chance of heads and a one-half chance of tails. That does not mean that if we flip the coin ten times, we should get exactly five heads and exactly five tails. It's just that our chances are, for each flip, a one-half or fifty percent chance of heads versus tails. Um, so keep that in mind for genetics crosses, that we're not always going to get exact offspring like we predict. Now, our father of genetics is Gregor Mendel. He was an Austrian monk and he studied pea plants. He's the first one uh, to do quantitative or numerical studies. So he actually crossed his plants, uh, kept records of exactly how many came out tall, how many came out short. And so this is really what led him to his principles of inheritance, which we still follow today. He wasn't really accepted for his work in his time because they didn't really know about DNA and chromosomes and all of that, but today, we realized that everything he said was correct. So there's uh, several reasons why pea plants turn out to be a really good choice. So it's very lucky that he happened to be working with pea plants, or he probably would not have made the discoveries he made. One thing is um, that pea plants were self-pollinating. What that means is it was really easy, and this will make a little more sense later, but if I draw sort of a sloppy flower here, so this is my pea plant, and the pea plants actually have, these are the male parts, the stamen, and then they have a pistil, which is the female part, and the eggs are located in here. Bottom line is, if he wanted to, he could actually let this plant fertilize itself. So he wouldn't even have to do anything here. He could, he could let the plant fertilize itself, and that way he would know uh, who the father was and who the mother was, because it would be the same plant. And this is still sexual reproduction, because of meiosis. Um, and again, this may make a little more sense later. He could also, what he usually did in his crosses, if he wanted to cross two completely different plants, is remove the male parts so this plant couldn't fertilize itself, bring over the male parts from a plant that showed a different version of the tree, and then fertilize them by hand. So these were, this made them very easy to work with in that way. Now obviously animals, we can't do that, but there are some characteristics that would make particular animals good for studying. So any kind of organism that has traits that are simple and easy to see, Pea plants had these kinds of traits. For example, flowers were either purple or white. That's it. If you cross purple with white, you get purple. If you, you know, so you don't get weird in between traits. You don't see a range of traits. And this is one thing that makes humans hard to study. Like if you think of, of things like hair color, skin color, eye color, they're not simple. They're complicated. There's a whole range of eye colors and hair colors. So Mendel would have not been able to study that because it wouldn't have made any sense, those outcomes. But pea plants were simple. Also, they grow really fast. They reproduce quickly. They mature fast. And they have lots and lots of offspring. Every pea is an offspring. So one plant might make a thousand peas. So that would make, uh, make them very easy to study because you could study several generations in a short period of time. So if you're ever asked... On, a, on an AP exam, and this was a question uh, several years ago, you know, what organism might be good for, and they had given some genetic data, you're looking for things that fit these characters. It's not the self-pollination, but easy traits, simple to see, fast to grow, have lots of offspring. Mice, rabbits, fruit flies, they, they would accept any kind of probably insect, dogs and cats. What would be bad things? Bacteria, no, because they don't reproduce sexually. People, no, because we, we take way too long to grow. We don't have a lot of offspring. Whales would be a very bad choice. Horses, not really a good choice. Only one or two babies at a time, much harder to study. So look for these characteristics as things that would be good or easy to study. Okay, so what he specifically did is he would always take purebred parents. In other words, parents, he didn't know that they were genetically purebred. But basically, plants in one area of the garden, for example, always made tall plants. Their offspring were tall, and yet plants in another area of the garden were always short. Their offspring were always short. So he called these purebreds because they always made offspring like them. And he called this the P generation, which stood for parental. So when he would cross two of these, he would look at their offspring. That was the F1. It actually stands for first 
filial generation. Filial is a uh, Latin, I believe it means child or son or something like that. So the F1, this was their children. And then the children of them was the, were the F2. So we, he would cross two of these F1 offspring together and get the F2. So let me show you um, a little diagram of what this might look like. And this will also give you a little preview of some of the information. So this is the P generation. In any genetics cross where you're starting with purebreds, we're going to call our original purebreds our P generation. Their offspring, notice, he crossed tall and short. All the offspring came out tall. Now we're going to talk about this in a few minutes, but in every cross that he did, one of the traits always covered up the other. And this is where he got the word dominant from. Uh, and so what we would usually do, and again, this is going to come up in a minute, is we will pick one letter to represent the trait, and we'll usually use the letter for the dominant version. So tall is dominant, so we'll use T. So this parent would carry two copies of T. Think about a diploid organism. Big T, big T. The short one that's purebred would be little t, little t. Each of those parents is only going to randomly give one copy of their T gene to the offspring. So the offspring would get one copy from mom, one copy from dad, and the offspring would be big T, little t. They would show tall because tall, he discovered, was dominant. Now, the F1s, he crossed them with each other. So he would cross, technically what he would do is let these self-fertilize. But you could also cross two offspring from here with one another. So you're crossing big T, little t with big T, little t. And in his next generation, the F2, and you could go on and do F3, F4, but we never really go beyond F2 in our crosses. He showed that shorts, that trait that seemed to disappear, hadn't really disappeared. It just sort of got masked for a generation, and it actually comes back. And that's because, and again, this is sort of a preview, because since these are actually still carrying little t, it's certainly possible when you cross two of these together that this one gives little t, the other parent gives little t, and hey, short comes back. So this is sort of a, an overview, but this F1, F2, and P will come up in genetics questions where they'll tell you to cross two purebreds and then cross the F1, and that's what you're going to do. You're going to cross your original ones and then cross two of their offspring. So he came up with from this three principles. His first principle is called the principle of dominance. It basically says some traits mask or cover up others, and we call those dominant, and we call the ones that get masked recessive, and I just talked about this on the previous slide. Whenever you cross two purebreds, you'll know which trait is dominant because the offspring will show the dominant trait. So in his cross, remember, he did big T, big T, little t, little t. The offspring all came out tall, um, and they were big T, little t. Now, we have a word for this, we use the term allele to represent a version of a gene. In other words, in this particular cross we were just looking at, there was one gene for height, one gene, but it had two alleles or two versions, big T for tall, little t for short, meaning that a chromosome could either carry, because we'll be talking about chromosomes eventually, a DNA code in this particular spot, and that particular code codes for making a tall plant. The other version of, of the same chromosome had a slightly different DNA code, and it's the code for making a short plant. And since tall is dominant, you only need one copy of that big T to make the plant tall. Now, we will talk about traits that don't follow Mendel's rules. What if you cross tall and short and get medium height? Well, that doesn't happen in pea plants, but it could happen in some other organism, and we'll talk about that. These are just a list of some of the traits he crossed, and you'll notice they're all really easy to see. And every single one, he was very lucky, every single one showed this principle of dominance where one version covered up the other. His second principle is the principle of segregation. He didn't actually use the word meiosis. He actually didn't use the word gene or allele or chromosome. He said factor. He said there were two factors, and during uh, some process, these factors segregate or separate. And it basically, segregate just means to separate from one another. So in other words, this parent is big A, big A, but... When they make sperm or eggs, they're only going to get one copy of the egg. This parent is little a, little a, so like our P generation. When they make sperm or eggs, they're only going to give little a. And then the offspring, when these get together, would be big A, little a. But segregation would specifically refer to this step right here, when the parent that's carrying two copies randomly only gives one to an offspring. So that's segregation. A lot of people mix it up with independent assortment. 
independent assortment really only applies when we're talking about multiple traits. So this particular principle will make more sense when we're looking at two traits at one time. But what it says from our previous chapter, you should know this, that each chromosome pair segregates or separates randomly compared to every other chromosome pair. And there was a mathematical formula, 2 to the n, and we're going to talk more about that again um, tomorrow as well. So the principle of independent assortment, this is just sort of an analogy of it. Notice how they could line up with the two blue ones on the left and the two pink ones on the right, or they could line up where the big pink's with the little blue, or big pink with little blue, big blue with little pink. That's independent assortment, that during metaphase one, it's random how each pair lines up, which, on, which one's on the left and which one's on the right. And again, we can only really study independent assortment if we're looking at the chances of two traits appearing at the same time. So we'll talk more about it later. All right, some basic genetic vocabulary. Gene is the code for a trait. Again, we usually use the first letter of the dominant allele, the first letter of the dominant version. So don't use two letters. Don't do T for tall and S for short. You want to use capital T for tall, little t for short. Purebred or true breeding or homozygous basically refers to an organism where the two alleles are the same. So big T, big T, or, or little t, little t. Uh, if they specifically say homozygous dominant, now we're talking about big T, big T. If they say homozygous recessive, or we're talking about little t, little t. And quite honestly, we don't even have to say purebred recessive or homozygous recessive because if a trait is truly recessive, the only way you'd see the trait is if they're homozygous because big T, big T, and big T, little t, if a trait is dominant, they will both code for the dominant version of the trait. So you would only actually see recessive if they were homozygous. Heterozygous, there's also the word hybrid, which is not used as much, but it means the same thing. This is any organism that's got big T, little t, big letter, little letter. And again, if this is a regular Mendel cross, that organism would show the dominant trait. The only way you'd see the recessive is if they're little t, little t. Genotype and phenotype. So the genotype is the gene combination for a trait, big T, big T, big T, little t, or little t, little t. The phenotype is what they will physically look like. This is the appearance. So blonde hair, tall, short, red flowers, whatever it is. And we're going to come back to this later, but keep in mind that environment plays a role in this as well. For example, Arctic foxes um, have the code for brown fur. But that gene is only triggered in temperatures above, I don't know, let's just say above 40 degrees. Well, that would mean that if you keep your fox above 40, he's going to be brown. But if you keep your fox at 20 degrees, he's actually going to be white. Not because his genes code for white, but because the genes are only activated by certain temperatures. So genes, expression of genes can rely, this phenotype, on lots of other factors besides just our genetic code. And finally, a Punnett square. This is a representation, a graphic representation of a genetics cross. So the thing with Punnett squares is keep in mind that they're, they're supposed to represent the possible outcomes of a cross. So for example, if I'm crossing big T, big T, and little t, little t, this parent can only give big T, this parent can only give little t. This would literally be my Punnett square, one box. Now let's say I'm crossing big T, little t, with little t, little t. This parent could give big T or little t, that's what we're representing, and this parent can only give little t. Notice this time, only two boxes. Most of you are familiar with the four box Punnett square, which is necessary if we're crossing big T, little t with big T, little t, because we need to represent, again, the possibilities of what each parent might donate in meiosis. And then we put our letters back together, big T, little t, big T, little t, little t, little t. So please keep that in mind, that you don't need four boxes. You need the number of boxes necessary to represent the possible outcomes. That's it. So here's a, a sample here. So this is a, whoops, this is a four box Punnett square. And notice that's because these are our possible outcomes. If they ask you for the genotype and phenotype ratio, so the phenotype ratio is what they're gonna look like. So in this scenario, three fourths would be tall, one fourth short, predicted. You can also say 75%, 25%. The genotype ratio is the ratio of the letter combinations. So in this scenario, one fourth or 25% could be big T, big T, one half or 50% big T, little t, and one fourth 
or 25% little t, little t. So we're going to wrap it up in class today by doing these five problems, which I'll go over tomorrow.